Private Property and Property Rights An Analysis There is a problem with human action that results in conflicts. Scarcity there is, a single, there is a single correct solution to scarcity, and thus conflict. Private Property Private property is a clearly defined system of individuals, their actions, and how they relate to scarce goods. <clears throat> There are four interrelated rules that govern private property and how people gain and transfer ownership of scarce goods. Firstly, people have ownership over their own physical body. Before establishing ownership over any other scarce goods, individuals have to possess ownership over themselves. Only the individual can and should have control over his own physical body and therefore his actions and speech. Only the individual who makes an action should have to reap either the rewards or consequences of it. Otherwise, this constitutes the slavery, that individuals are forced to serve another individual and cannot freely act in accordance to their own physical body. <clears throat> Secondly, individuals gain ownership over an economic good when they are the first ones to interact or appropriate a specific good and after they put it to use by the means of their body to achieve a certain self-interest. Ownership in accordance with scarce goods means to have exclusive and full control of specific scarce goods and the services, benefit, or wealth that is derived from these goods, which are either possessions, land, or assets. This means that only the individual that has ownership over a good can, can use it either to consume, generate wealth, sell, give away, dispose, or remove the property. Property only becomes property if it has an owner. Without an owner, goods simply are unclaimed resources and another individual can claim ownership over them. For example, a person gains ownership over a piece of land. He is the first one to interact with this piece of land, and he has an intention of building a house there. He, also, he will also enforce his newly acquired property with a border, a fence in this case. A border is meant to indicate that someone is already in ownership of this land and that no one can, without the owner's explicit permission, enter and appropriate any scarce goods on that territory, given that the owner has exclusive and full control over any goods that are on the land he owns. He only gained ownership over this property because he used the land to achieve a particular end, to live on, and thus it is his property as soon as he derives a plan on what to do with the good in question. In theory, an individual can claim ownership over a large, unclaimed island. But if an individual is never going to do anything with it, or, is, or it is useless to the individual, he will, he will either divest himself or abandon it. This claim, then, is null and void, is effectively worthless, and the land is still not technically owned by anyone. This theory of property ownership I just described is called the proxiological theory of property. As opposed to the labor theory of property, which states that mixing one's labor with an object in the external environment will make that good the first appropriator's property. However, it is not the labor that makes a particular scarce good one's property. It is the thing's use in a plan of action or if the scarce resource is used with a purpose. Thirdly, the wealth or product generated by one's originally appropriated goods and their labor is owned by them meaning that they are in ownership of the product that was created with these appropriated goods and their labor. This is because the labor, which is your bodily actions, are controlled by you. You exclusively use and control your body. And then the originally appropriated goods are yours because you are the first one to interact with them. This assumes the goods used in the creation of products are not stolen or the labor used was not created by a person in a state of involuntary servitude. Finally, once a good has been first appropriated or produced, ownership of these goods can only be acquired through the means of voluntary contractual transfer of its property title, typically done through trade, inheritance, inheritance or charity. Theft is the involuntary transfer of a good's property title, and thus is illegitimate. The institution of private property has significantly reduced the amount of conflicts that occur over scarce resources, maximized economic incentives, efficiency, and provided a way for the individuals to innovate, create new products, generate wealth, and with inheritance, allow for the growth of wealth that, through generations of property ownership. But can't there be a different solution to property? A different way to resolve conflicts resulting from scarcity. 
instead of private property in which the first appropriator becomes the owner of a specific scarce good the first appropriator along of the late along with all the latecomers should become owners of the good this is called the collective ownership of property in which not a single individual or legal entity which are individuals that voluntarily agreed to form the entity to achieve their mutual self-interest have exclusive control to use the property but rather it is the property of everyone in a specific group or society in simple terms the collective ownership of property implies that no one owns anything and every scarce resource can be used by anyone the collective ownership of property is not an alternative to private property as unlike private property, it does not successfully resolve conflicts regarding individuals and scarce resources or economic goods deriving from those scarce resources. Under the collective ownership of property, there can be tens, hundreds, or even thousands of people that have quote-unquote full control over the property. People, especially in a larger society, will inevitably have disagreements on how to use the property and what to do with it. Conflicts will occur due to these disagreements, and the main problem is that the issue of scarcity is not resolved. The goods are not perceived as scarce under the collective ownership of property. Multiple people, many people, multiple or many people can and do have ownership over the same scarce resource, and thus rejecting the idea that a scarce good can only be used by, the, by a specific individual who has appropriated that good. Different people may claim the first appropriator is good, take it without consequences, and use it, and thus the scarce resource belongs effectively to no one and is under the exclusive control of no one. In itself, the collective ownership of property is an oxymoron. No individual or groups of individuals can have exclusive control over a specific economic resource, meaning that everyone will be permitted to freely take possessions from one and another and use them. This, of course, would result in conflicts over scarce resources and is no better than no property rights in the first place. In economical terms, collective ownership of property is also extremely inefficient. Individuals don't own the products created by their appropriated goods and thus anyone can freely confiscate them until someone then confiscates it from the confiscator. And repeat, the cycle continues. People don't work or produce wealth unless they have a clear incentive to and in a collective in society they have they have no incentive to the products created using someone's appropriated goods aren't theirs and can be used and taken with by anyone in the society thus you can keep the products created using the originally appropriated goods and your labor this means that people will not produce given that they can keep use or sell the products created using their original property which should probably be taken too and people would simply live off the labor and property of others. In addition, the collective quote-unquote ownership creates waste and irresponsible use of economic goods and assets. People act as if no one owns it, and thus the system of collective ownership systemically encourages irresponsibility and wasteful capital consumption and individuals taking without producing. Due to the lack of incentives for wealth production, the inability for individuals to appropriate any scarce economic goods creates devastation, conflicts, and terror among men. A complete collectivist society in which no one can own anything will result in death and the eventual destruction of all individuals and thus the collective as a whole. One final thing to mention is that the, is that the partial ownership of property meaning that when p multiple individuals have parts of a specific economic resource or asset, such as a house or company, doesn't imply collective ownership. Since, by the, log by the logic of economic resources and how they relate to the individuals and economic goods, no two individuals can own the same scarce resource at the same time and same place. For example, some people think that when two people sign an agreement to both live and have co-ownership over a house, that that is collective ownership of the house by two individuals. However, this is not the case due to the fact that no two individuals can own the same can own the same scarce resource. They don't actually have ownership over the complete house. Instead, each individual signed the contract to own a part of the house. In this case, each individual owns 50% of the house. 
Each individual pays for 50% of the property taxes, 50% of the energy and water bills, and 50% of the expenses to maintain and fix the damages of the house. If they both agree to sell the house, they each get 50% of the sales money. Of course, this doesn't always apply in some cases, as in individuals pay exactly 50% of the expenses. However, an individual can voluntarily assist another in his payment of these bills by transferring money to his co-owner's account and paying under his co-owner's name. Thus, my original point still stands. Individuals engaged in co-ownership own 50% of the property, and thus they incur 50% of the expenses associated with the ownership of part of the property. In short, both individuals don't collectively own the house. Each individual exclusively controls and privately owns 50% or half the house. If the contract involved four individuals, each individual would exclusively own 25% of the house, or a quarter, as opposed to owning half the house, as with the co-ownership of two individuals. Before someone asks, no, using the or having possession over the house and having ownership over it are two completely different things. Possession is different than ownership. A perfect example is renting an apartment. The owner gives the tenant permission to live on his property, which is a service valued by individuals. So the tenant pays the owner, the owner, yeah, the tenant pays the owner whatever the market price is for the specific apartment to live in, not to own. The tenant has possession over the property, but the owner has ownership over it, and he also incurs the expenses associated with the ownership of property. The owner pays property taxes, deals with managing and maintaining the building, and pays for all the repairs to fix or change the apartment. Due to this, the owner has a right to exercise his property rights to be able to freely evict the tenant out of his property if the tenant is, lo is no longer wanted. Another example of partial ownership of property, or in this case an asset, is a public company, also sometimes called a joint stock company. Individuals don't actually collectively own the entire corporation. Instead, they exclusively have ownership over a purchased part of the corporation, also called a share. Depending on how the corporation is doing, the price and therefore the perceived value of the share can either increase or decrease. The greater amount of money an individual invested, the more shares, shares he has which means that he owns a greater portion of that corporation. If the company is making a lot of profit, the price of shares increases and the perceived value rises. If the company is incurring losses, the price of, sh of the share decreases and the perceived value falls. If an individual owns a greater portion of the corporation, he is more affected by profits and losses. An example being that if an individual owns 1% of the corporation in total shares, he gains 1% of the net profit or incurs 1% of the net losses. If the total profit generated by a corporation engaging in business activity was $100,000, was $100, his total gain is $1,000. And if the, the, cor the corporation incurs a net loss of, of $100,000, his total loss is one is $1,000. If another individual has 20% of the corporation through shares at the same time, with the same theoretical amount of profits and losses as before, he gains $20,000 when there is a net profit and loses $20,000 when there is a net loss. The greater amount of money invested, the more an individual can potentially gain or lose. The corporation isn't being collectively owned, as if every individual is the owner of the entire corporation. That is simply not possible due to the economic laws regarding scarcity, including assets. Instead, different parts of the corporation are owned by various individuals. Voting in a public company is done based off shares. Each share is a vote, so depending on how many shares you have, that is how many votes you have. If you have more shares, and that's a greater portion of the corporation owned by yourself, your vote matters more for the decisions of the company. To wrap up this section, divided, partial, or fractional ownership, whatever you like to call it, when people own parts of property or an asset, such as a house or a legal entity, is not collective ownership. Individuals don't collectively own the entire corporation or house. 
They simply have full control or private ownership of over a part or fraction of the property or asset. Now we have identified that there exists no alternative to private property to resolve conflicts caused by scarce resources. What, exa what actually are property rights? Property rights are inalienable and they are essentially ethical principles that no one may prevent or deprive an individual of control over his body and the goods he first appropriated or received through voluntary contractual exchange. This means that no individual or legal entity can deprive you of an ability to receive an economic product through the voluntary transfer of its property title, and no one can involuntarily confiscate your property, or in other terms, no one can involuntarily transfer an item's ownership title from you to themselves. Property rights are typically enforced through the government, even though the enforcement of property rights by the state inherently requires the violation of these rights themselves or through a voluntarily formed agency with its goal as the protection of these rights. Which is better, of course. Property rights allow for the acu wealth accumulation without interference, and people work hardest for their own good. Inheritance of these property titles allows the growth and expansion of wealth through the generations, as long as wealth is not wastefully consumed. Private property is the cornerstone of the capitalist economy and allows for the accumulation and exchange of economic goods and wealth. Voluntary trade allows individuals to receive what they value more than what they currently have, creating more economic value for both sides of the exchange, benefiting both parties involved. However, border, or sometimes called direct exchange, has clear limitations and that is why people early on developed a median of exchange, which is an inter- mediary instrument, item, or system used to facilitate the sale, purchase, or trade of goods between parties. A medium of exchange or an indirect exchange system solves the problem of border or a direct exchange system by removing the want of coincidence, which requires each party to a transaction to have something the other desires, the want of a measure of value, which assumes that everyone ha has to know the value of a product in relation to other products, and other issues such as value e equivalency and issues with foreign long distance and transactions in a given time period. A medium of exchange makes it much easier to exchange, trade, and approximate the value of a product, making it easier to sell goods, services, and your labor at prices, which are how many exchange rate units, $2,000, as an example, $2,000, a one ounce gold coin, or 100 one ounce silver coins, something is on average valued by consumers mostly based on supply, demand, but also based on costs, quality, design, or other appeal. Private property leads to the division of labor, which is when individuals produce what they are the most relatively efficient at and relying on other individuals to produce and sell them what they need. The division of labor allows for the increase of efficient production, therefore results in increased supply of what consumers need and want, massively improving the purchasing power of the individual and living standards. On a global scale, scarce resources that may be considered rare in one country and thus expensive to buy and manufacture consumer goods can be abundant and comparatively cheap in another country. Thus, it is, imported, it is better to import from that country than purchase from your local country. The consumer good thus will also be cheaper as the expense of importing from a different country is much cheaper than buying it from the home nation. Global trade emphasizes the division of labor on a global scale. Each nation's or country citizens produce the goods which are the cheapest and highest quality at home relative to other nations and import the goods which are impossible or expensive to manufacture at home and available much cheaper in other nations. Global trade benefits both producers and consumers. Producers can minimize costs and expenses based on the supply and demand of goods and also create jobs for people of foreign nations who needed the most and pay them cheaper than the population of a different nation. By doing this, they can maximize profits to invest in future production, consumption, job creation, or invest in the creation of better, more innovative products which benefit consumers. Consumers benefit from global free trade because they can receive the highest quality products at the lowest prices possible. Overall, 
private property and property rights are taken for granted in the United States, especially by its corrupt politicians who seek to gain political power by subjugating individual liberty. However, never forget that private property and the enforcement of private property, which are property rights, are not only the cornerstone of the economy, but also have effectively eliminated conflicts over scarce resources and have let individuals live in peace and prosperity. Thank you for watching this video. Goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day.